Form BX257 was one of the first people to talk about G.I. Joe on YouTube. He inspired a community of G.I. Joe fans. He's the reason I am here. He started Cobra Convergence with me and Timmer. Two years ago, Kevin posted his last review. No one has heard from him since. We hope he is well, and we hope he will return. Today, we honor our friend. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. We are in Cobra Convergence 7. It's the seventh year of G.I. Joe fans coming together to talk about Cobra. You can find information about it on my website, hcc788.com. Cobra Convergence started in 2016 with a collaboration between me and Timmer from Half the Battle and Form BX257. And for the first few years of the event, we were all in it. Kevin had taken a couple breaks from making YouTube videos, but in April of 2021, he had returned. And in May of 2021, he posted a review of the 1989 Mud Fighter. That was his last review. Without warning or explanation, he disappeared, and nobody's heard from him since. I tried to reach out to him, but I didn't hear back. We don't know if he's okay, or if he needs help, or if he just moved on with his life. Whatever the reason, we still miss him and think of him often. The last Cobra Convergence video from Form BX257 was the 1992 Cobra Eels in Cobra Convergence 4, and that's the figure we are reviewing today. And I've asked some people to join me in honor of the grandfather of G.I. Joe YouTube reviews, HCC788 and CC7 present, the Cobra Eels. This is the Cobra Eels, the Cobra Underwater Specialist from 1992. This figure was available in 1992 only. It was discontinued for 1993. This is version 2 of the Cobra Eels. This version of the eel was designed by Kurt Groen for Hasbro and sculpted by Paul Sorton. How many versions of the Cobra Eels existed in the vintage era? More than you may think, the eels were the root of several branches of Cobra specialists. To talk about the vintage versions of the Cobra eels, this is Mike from What's on Joe Mind. Hey, this is Mike from What's on Joe Mind. Since my photo area is a bit destroyed right now, we're going to take a virtual look at the Cobra eel family. Here's the original Cobra eel from 1985, designed by the legendary Ron Rudat. He's a full-on classic in his gray, black, and red wetsuit with black dive gear. He's one of the best figures of a fantastic year of G.I. Joe figure designs. Our first eel in snake's clothing is also from 1985. It's the original Snow Serpent. On their file card, Snow Serpents are described as, quote, the Arctic branch of the Cobra Eels. Eel training is a prerequisite to Snow Serpent training. That makes a lot of sense. You'd want an Arctic environmental specialist to have basic dive skills. There's water everywhere. Our second example also arrived in 1985, as the Lamprey, the pilot of the Cobra Moray Hydrofoil, was revealed to be an offshoot of the Eels. The Lamprey file card states, quote, To qualify for Lamprey training, a candidate must be a Cobra Trooper in top physical condition who has completed his Eel training and been operational as an Eel for at least a year. In 1987, the Eels enter Cobra lore again. Piloting the Cobra Sea Ray requires one to be an eel, as the Sea Slugs file card explains that, quote, Sea Slugs are chosen from the ranks of eels. This is especially notable since the Cobra Eel was not available in stores in 1987. It was discontinued at the end of 1986. 1987 also saw the release of the Ice Viper, the driver of the Cobra Wolf. He's also related to the eel, because Ice Vipers are, again, according to their file card, quote, the mechanized branch of the Snow Serpents, both of which must first qualify as Cobra Eels. 1988's Hydro Viper is the Demon of the Deep, but first, that's right, he's a Cobra Eel. The Hydro Viper file card states that they, quote, are qualified eels, Cobra Frogmen, who volunteered to be surgically altered to withstand nitrogen narcosis and other side effects of deep diving. Ouch. 
the second version of the Snow Serpent was released in 1991, and its file card still referred to them as, quote, cold environment specialists of the eels. Remember, this is a full five years after the last time eels were sold at retail in 1986. Finally, in 1992, today's subject, the second version of the Cobra Eel was released. His bright blue and yellow wetsuit is a big departure from the first version, but at least it's a little forgivable since he also comes with a fella I like to call Chompy the Robot Shark. We love you, little Chompy. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. In 1993, a third Cobra Eel would be released as part of the Battle Corps line. That figure used the same mold as version 2, but was a little bit more purple and had different accessories. He was not released with Chompy the Robot Shark, so we don't like him nearly as much, and we're not going to talk about him anymore. There were other Cobra Water specialists and divers, but their files don't make any mention of them being related to the Cobra Eel Corps. Here's a last quick look at the full family tree for today's subject, Cobra Eels, Version 2. Since so many Cobra units came from the eels, they are probably the most important branch of Cobra. All troops start as vipers, but eel training is required to advance to more elite teams. The only group that could claim to be equally important would be the Crimson Guard. G.I. Joe had some counterparts to the eels, guys who worked underwater, and mostly they were versions of Deep Six and Wetsuit, but the first one was Torpedo from 1983. He was a Navy Sea in a black and gray diving suit. Torpedo was followed up in 1984 by Deep Six version 1, the driver of the Shark flying submarine. He was in a mechanical deep sea diving suit. In 1986, there was Wetsuit version 1, another Navy SEAL in a diving suit and scuba gear. Also in 1986, there was a second version of Wetsuit released as part of the Special Mission Brazil set. It was the same figure in different colors. In 1989, we got got Deep Six version 2. He was no longer a vehicle driver, and he had a better-looking deep-sea diving suit. In 1992, the same year the Eel version 2 was released, we got Wetsuit version 3, the Navy SEAL in an updated and, I will say, better-looking diving suit. Also in 1992, there was Deep Six version 3 from the Eco Warriors subset. He was the deep water specialist. He had a colorful diving suit, and this was a man with a a porpoise. In 1993, there was a wetsuit version 4 in the Battle Corps set that was the same as version 3, but in different colors. There was also a 1993 Deep Six version 4 that was the mail-away version that was the same as version 2, but in different colors. Finally, in 1994, there was Shipwreck version 2. Version 1 of Shipwreck from 1985 was a sailor, but version 2 was a Navy SEAL in a diving suit. I hear he was quite the stinky diver. There's an outlier in all of these enemies of the Cobra Eel, Undertow from 1990, Destro's Frogman. This wasn't a Joe character, but this could have been an enemy of the Eel. Destro sometimes worked with Cobra and sometimes worked against them. To talk about the card back for this figure, here is Snuva's Corner Cafe. Hey everybody, it's Dave from Snuva's Corner Cafe here. I'm going to walk you through the card back here for the Eel version 2, so let's take a look at it. Alright, first of all, we got this red background here. It was something they were doing in the 90s. This indicates that he is a bad guy. Uh, the blue would be for the Joe characters and such. Um, we got the number 12 here. You can't see it. Mine's a little peeled off, but he's number 12 in the 1992 series. Um... We got that the shark shoots torpedo and battle stand included. Um, got this card art here with the eel with his trident gun and the uh, the robotic shark. Um, artwork was probably done by Hector Garrido. Um, over here we got instructions for how to fire the torpedo out of the shark's mouth and also how to use the battle stand if you couldn't figure that one out. Um, Flipping over to the back here, we got the cross cell of all the figures that were coming out this year. Um, got Watch the New Adventures of G.I. Joe here for the new cartoon series. Uh, we got ads for the Drug Elimination Force, Eco Warriors, and Ninja Force. Got a 90s style flag point there and a 90s style file card. We now had the little picture up here. We had the picture here with the diagram of 
uh, different uh, accessories and features that he had. Um, I would just, I do want to add one interesting fact here is that he's got some extra details on the face. And if you look at the figure here, uh, he is missing it. Uh, you can see where the grooves are there, but they are unpainted. Uh, on the card art, uh, you can see where it looks like they had black lines there done. Um, I kind of wish they would have added that. I think it would have been a, uh, a cool addition to the figure's look. So that is your card back there. These 90s file cards had a numbered list of descriptions of the features and accessories, so I will refer to this list when describing those features and accessories. Let's look at those accessories, and I'm not going to start with the obvious one that you're staring at right now. I'm going to start with the Trident Spear Gun. This is in yellow plastic. It has a three-prong trident spear, which is why it's called a trident. It has a pistol grip. This grip fits very tightly in my figure's hand, so I'm not going to put it in his hand because I don't want to risk breaking the thumb. It has a very short shoulder stock. The file card calls this a nautical spear gun with three-prong hull puncturing spear. You probably immediately thought of the trident spear gun that came with the 1986 Dreadnought monkey wrench, and there are obvious similarities, but this does not appear to be an adaptation of Monkey Wrench's spear gun. The details are totally different. This appears to be a totally new mold. The next accessory we're going to look at is not that one. We are going to look at the swim fins. These swim fins are in silver plastic. They have foot pegs, so they will fit on the feet of the action figure. They have a ridge pattern on the flipper. The file card calls these stable Stabilizer foot fins for power swimming. These swim fins are reissued from the swim fins that came with 1990 Undertow. That's the same accessory but in a different color. These flippers were also issued in yellow for the 1993 Eels version 3 and in black for the 1994 Shipwreck version 2. Both of these swim fins are the same. There is not a left or right one, so it doesn't matter which foot you put them on. I don't mind the reuse of an accessory like this. It's generic enough that any design will look similar. There's no reason to spend the time and money designing new swim fins when that effort could go towards something more important. The next accessory is not that one. It is the figure stand. This is a standard black figure stand with a single foot peg to fit on the action figure's feet. This is a nice bonus with 90s figures. 80s figures did not include figure stands and 90s figures did. In this case, the figure stands very well on the swim fin, so you don't really need the figure stand so you could give this to someone else. And now the moment you've all been waiting for the shark and the torpedo. The shark is in silver plastic. The torpedo is in yellow plastic. It is a robot shark that shoots a torpedo out of its mouth. It also has a back peg so it can fit on the figure's back. The file card calls the shark a torpedo launching robot shark slash scuba pack and the torpedo is a silent running high impact torpedo. Since this is a scuba pack, can the eel breathe underwater without it? The card implies that he can. Since it attaches to the back of the figure, you could imagine it propelling him through the water. This is a unique take on the 90s spring-loaded missile launcher trend. The robot shark has a jaw and a dorsal fin and a tail that can be removed. The jaw and the tail are articulated. As you can see, the robot shark has a single yellow torpedo in his jaw. The shark can fire that torpedo with a spring firing mechanism. To talk to us about the eel's robot shark is someone who knows a lot about it. This is Jason from the Order of Battle podcast. Hey, Hooded Cobra Commander. This is Jason from Order of Battle podcast, or Caesar Moo on Instagram and Twitter. It's been an excellent Cobra Convergence this year. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and help with the robot shark that came with the 92 eels. This shark joins the pantheon of perfect pets. Junkyard, Freedom, Clyde, Max, Order, and all the others. But unlike any of the other pets, including the Barracuda and the Devil Ray, the shark can also peg in as a backpack. This duality alone makes it my favorite troop builder of the entire G.I. Joe line. You know there are two versions of the robot shark, Hasbro and Fun School, India and Russia. The US Hasbro sharks are extremely prevalent, as are the Russian Fun School. 
This is recognized by how much harder it is to find an India card back than a Russian card back, but certainly not impossible, and the fun school shark is not rare. The main thing to understand about the sharks is how to tell the difference between Hasbro and fun school. First, Hasbro's gray body plastic is a bit shinier, but with age, discoloring, dirtiness, it may be hard to tell even in hand. It is near impossible online the way most people take photos. Now the Hasbro missiles, just like the Eels gun, are a much more obvious neon -y yellow. The main and accurate way to tell the difference between a fun school shark and a Hasbro shark is to get them in hand and feel the rigidity of the fins. So get your hands on the dorsal fin, the two pectoral fins, and the elusive tail fin. Hasbro's fins are flexible, though not gummy. Fun School are inflexible and quite rigid. The only reproduction fins I've seen so far are a flat gray, similar to the Fun School. They are rigid, as one might expect, but a little less than a Fun School, and clearly, at least in hand, different from the Hasbro or the Fun School. All of the technical readout aside, I love to troop build the shark. I like the eels version too, but I specifically troop build the shark itself. At this point, I have 117 completed sharks and 19 incomplete ones. That is growing. It's a fun pet that is functional with the eels version 1, version 2, the eels version 3, and that beautiful baby blue fun school eel. Finding a unique and weird troop builder is always going to be hard to store, but it's satisfying especially as the people in our community start to know and help you with your particular oddity. So thanks Hooded Cobra Commander for letting me spotlight my love of the sharks, send me all your extras, and for allowing me to help with Cobra Convergence 7. Let's demonstrate how to operate the Robot Shark Torpedo Launcher. You just lift the articulated jaw. There is a torpedo launcher barrel inside. You just press the torpedo into the barrel with the notch side up. Press it back until it clicks. The trigger is this small fin between the dorsal fin and the tail. You're going to press down on that to fire. Let's take aim at Dr. Mindbender. He's gone underwater because he's afraid of being hit by another missile, but little does he know behind him lurks a shark with a freaking torpedo attached to its mouth. Just aim the torpedo, press down on the fin to fire. That's the second week in a row that a figure has been taken out by his own weapon, but Cobra is not very concerned with the safety of their own guys. And now let's demonstrate him jumping the shark. Eel version 2 does not have traditional scuba tanks or hoses, which version 1 had with intricate detail. What it does have is a robot shark that shoots a torpedo, and that shark has a backpack, so you can use it as a sci-fi scuba tank with extra awesome, and it could propel him through the water. I'm Kevin from Peg Warmers, and I'm excited to be collabing with Hooded Cobra Commander on this video and all the rest of the Cobra Convergence people participating in this video. Let's take a look at the articulation on Cobra Eels. He had the articulation that was standard on G.I. Joe's in 1992. He can turn his head from left to right and look up and down. He can lift his arm at the shoulder and swivel it all the way around. He had a hinge at the elbow so he could bend it about 90 degrees. He had a swivel at the bicep so he could swivel it all the way around. This is an O-ring figure, meaning that he had a rubber O-ring holding the figure together inside that allowed him to move around a bit. He can move his legs apart so far. He can move his hips about 90 degrees and bend the knees about 90 degrees. Let's look at the sculpt design and color of Eels version 2. As mentioned, this entire mold was reused for 1993 Eels version 3. 1985 Eels version 1 is relatively subdued with gray, black, and dark red. Version 1 was also sharply detailed and had a lot of appropriate accessories. Version 2 is brightly colored and the details are wild. Looking at the head, he has a yellow helmet that covers his entire head. He has 
has two fins on top of the helmet. He has a wide, protruding red visor, and he has vents on the side of the helmet. Those look like gills. In fact, they're supposed to be gills. He has a blue neck. On its own, this head sculpt isn't too bad, but the head is kind of small. The version 1 figure had a larger head because he was wearing a helmet. Version 2 is also wearing a helmet, but his head is tiny. The head on version 2 is also much less detailed than version 1. According to Dan Klingensmith's book, Kurt Groen designed this helmet to be a rebreather with gills. The file card points to the chest and not the helmet as the breathing apparatus. That may have been a mistake. The fins on the top of this helmet may look a little odd, but there's another figure with a similar look, the 1991 Toxo Viper version 2. Looking at the chest, he has a yellow vest on the upper chest. The vest has a hatch pattern on the front and the back. The file card calls this a coral-proof anti-spear chest protector. That chest protector has some raised piping around the arms and the neck. It has some raised panels over the shoulders and around the upper back. The file card calls this a sophisticated, all-encompassing breathing apparatus. Again, I think that description is supposed to point to the helmet, but the file card does point to the chest. On the abdomen, he has blue all the way around the front and the back. It has minimal detail, but it does have sculpted abs. His abdominal muscles are so cut, you can see them through the wetsuit. His arms feature long blue sleeves. He has a red cobra emblem on the right upper arm. On the outside upper arms, he has yellow spiked fins. He has yellow spiked fins on his forearms as well, and yellow bands around his wrists and he has blue gloves. That's a bit different from the file card where it shows he's wearing no gloves. The waist piece is blue. I'm assuming all of this blue is the wetsuit. He has a yellow belt with a circular belt buckle and on his hips he has yellow pointed fins. His legs are mostly blue. Again, I believe the blue is the wetsuit. On the outside upper legs he has ridged yellow fins and he has large yellow fins on the outside of the lower legs. He has yellow bands around his shins and ankles, and he has blue boots. The file card calls these ridged fins hull slashing wetsuit fins. Besides being brightly colored, he's also very simply colored. There are only three colors on this figure. The shark and the flippers add some color interest. The spear gun would help if it weren't yellow. There's already yellow on the figure. Maybe if this were a different color, it would have added added a bit more depth. Between the hull-piercing spear and the hull-slashing wetsuit fins, it's clear this eel's job is sinking ships. Sharp hips sink ships. Now we hear from one of the first Cobra Convergence, Timmer, from Half the Battle. Okay, so the yellow on this figure is absolutely awful. It's just so garish. But you know what? Rather than complain about it, I did something about it. So meet Timmer's Eel version 2. This figure was released by me just now, with no original body parts. And doesn't it look much more handsome? This is the toy we could have had, people. Just compare and contrast, it's clear which one you would be proud to bring home to your mother. Now please, enjoy the rest of the review. Let's take a look at the Cobra Eels file card. It's printed on the back of the card on which the figure was packaged. This is a 90s style file card, so it is rectangular with rounded corners. There's a copy of the artwork from the front of the card with a list of those features and accessories. There's a close-up portrait of the eels here. His codename is Eels Plural, and they are the Cobra Underwater Demolitions. There is a Cobra the Enemy graphic here that fills up some of this blank space. It says, Vehicle Specially Cobra rat pilot. Really, the Cobra Rat, one of the worst vehicles ever made in the G.I. Joe toy line. That vehicle did not come with an action figure driver, but I guess the Cobra Eels is supposed to drive it. It should be the Cobra Eels. He's going to need the scuba tank because the only thing the Cobra Rat can do on the water is sink. There's a quote here. It says, we're the soggy saboteurs. You know what? I think that should be read with a pirate voice. We're the soggy saboteurs of the sea. We're Cobra Eels. 
eels. We're wet and wild. It's eels gone wild. This sounds like an ad for a water park. This paragraph says, The Cobra underwater demolition specialists have come a long way since the days when they were trained in shark-infested waters to prove their worth. Eels must now be proficient with sophisticated electronic detection gear, the latest in plastic explosives, and state-of-the-art closed-circuit self-contained breathing systems. Of course, failure to pass the high-tech courses could result in a disciplinary dip in the shark tank. And we're not talking about the mechanical sharks, we're talking about real, live, hungry ones. Eels are also outfitted with razor-sharp fins on their suits so they can rip through the thickest hulls. Again, the final card emphasizes their job is to sink ships by cutting through their hulls. So G.I. Joe can send devil fishes and the USS Flag, and I guess the Cobra Eel is supposed to swim under them and cut them up. Looking at how the Cobra Eel was used in G.I. Joe media, in the animated series, he didn't have as many appearances as you would think. There were some Cobra Frogmen in the 1983 Mass Device miniseries Part 3, but they didn't look like eels and they weren't identified as eels. The first appearance was very briefly in the episode Cobra Stops the World. They fought Torpedo and Deep Six outside Cobra's sunken base. They used a sonic weapon that appears to be more annoying than deadly. The eel got the most screen time in the episode the germ. In that episode, a Crimson Guardsman steals a top-secret bacteria from a lab. A conflict within Cobra causes the bacteria to mutate into a giant germ. Cobra troopers put on eels uniforms to escape the germ in the water. This is surprising. It implies that the eel's uniform is just standard scuba gear that any trooper would wear for an underwater mission. The eel sort of appeared in the Deke era of the animated series. In the episode Messenger from the Deep, they attack Wetsuit using some underwater jet skis. Wetsuit identifies them as eels, but they are not. They are sludge vipers. Maybe they didn't have the Eels version 2 model at the time they made that episode, so they used one that was similar. They appeared for a couple seconds in the episode Metalhead's Reunion, but I can't tell if they were figure accurate or if they were still using the Sludge Viper model sheets. In the G.I. Joe comic book series published by Marvel Comics, they first appeared in issue number 47. They piloted the Cobra Hydro Sled and fought Storm Shadow on the Cobra Moray. The Lamprey first appeared in issue number 40, piloting the Moray Hydrofoil. The file card for the Lamprey says they are first eels, so is that the first appearance of the eels? In issue number 53, they participated in the attack on G.I. Joe's secret headquarters, the Pit. They beat up Flint. The version 2 uniform first appeared in issue number 130. A squad of eels were taken out by Ninja Force. Eels have bad luck with ninjas. They appeared again in issue number 137, where they were guarding the Silent Castle. A couple of them were killed by Destro and the Baroness. In issue number 140, they patrolled the sewers of Millville and encountered a Joe infiltration team there. The Eels were never major players in Cobra as far as media was concerned. In the later years, they got lost in the mix of the many specialized Vipers. A lot of those Vipers would have started as Eels. Looking at the Cobra Eels overall, the Eels version 1 is my favorite army builder. I think it looks great. The colors go really well together. There's a lot of great detail, and the accessories are intricate. I think it looks really good with the Cobra watercraft that were available at the time. In comparison, Eels version 2 is plain. Of course, I'm not a fan of the bright colors, but ignoring that, the design is simplified. It's surprisingly plain for a figure that calls itself the Eels. Change appears to be an intentional departure from version 1. This figure was not likely to get all the intricate paint, so it's better to smooth out the details than add a bunch of details that would be unpainted. The blue on the figure is good. It's a return to Cobra Blue. If the yellow on the figure had been gray instead, we would have a reasonable successor to the 1985 version 1. The accessories are not especially noteworthy, except for the robot shark. 
The Shark is special. It may be the most memorable missile launcher from the 1990s. It's a robot shark that shoots a missile out of its mouth. Of course it's absurd. Even giving Cobra the leeway to lean into sci-fi more than G.I. Joe, this is over the top. If you are trying to think of the most awesomest thing in a nine-year-old's mind, you might come up with a robot shark that shoots a torpedo out of its mouth. It can also be attached as a backpack, so it can be used as a scuba tank and an underwater vehicle. This is not in my wheelhouse. I am not a 90s guy. I will always love the 1985 Eels version 1, and this figure could not be more different. But, robot shark. Therefore, all contrary arguments are invalid. For some additional thoughts on the Cobra Eel, here is Codename Mewtwo-Vero2. Thanks, HCC788, and wow, I'm one of those guys who's been part of Cobra Convergence since Cobra Convergence 3, and I am so excited to see how much Cobra Convergence has grown over the years. Of course, all thanks to HCC788, and of course, all of you. Without you guys, none of this would be possible. And every year we have a new content creator. Now, even though I'm known mostly for doing the comic side of our fandom, I often do mythos as far as like, let's say for a classified figure, I'll go through the entire mythos and history of that uh, ca character. And it's been a big hit with a lot of the fans. And I love doing that. Now with the Cobra Eel it's kind of interesting. Now, when you look at the Rose Gallery of Cobra characters, um, it's often, this is the whole notion. You have a home run, often followed by a bunt. And some people may think that when you look at um, the eel version too. But no, that's not the case at all. And that's the beauty with Cobra in itself, is that you have an entire gallery of various types of troops, all with different specialties and different versions. So it's always an endless supply. So I wanted to point out these. Um, again, I would like to thank uh, Gary, who helped me um, save this moray from the dumpster. That's right. Gary was uh, kind enough to hook me up with basically a moray that has seen better days. And thanks to 3D printing, we brought this beautiful boat back from the dead. Now, in an earlier video, I talked about black major figures. And you could see with the Cobra Eel version 1, where that is a added uh, wonderful feature. As you could have different color combinations this one I think is more like a Python Patrol Cobra Eel. But again, I'm gonna be honest, with black major figures, you could feel that they're cheap and they don't have a good record as far as durability and because of the cheaper resin that they use, it'll often fall apart, especially when you have to swap in that O-ring. So, and plus black major is a crazy dude. Um, we've don't talk anymore, um, follow out from fall out from that video that we did earlier. But nonetheless, um, if you're able to, these are really good options to just add to your little splash to your diorama. Since guys like HC788 and shortly after me have been serving this community for a very long time, there are a few things one gets to notice and trends we picked up during the course of all these years. For example, Gen X, you know, mostly the 82 to 89 type of fan base, you know, they're more interested in the you know, grounded military, all that stuff. But then we have another group of fans, and those are the millennials, the 90s guys. And I think no figure, like, is a perfect example of that divide than the Cobra Eel version 2. Now, for Pete's sake, it has a freaking shark that it uses as a bazooka that comes with it. That alone is such crazy shit that it's cool. And even for us Gen Xers, we could appreciate that and kind of overlook the neon, uh, the neon yellow and blue combination. I mean, the fact that you have 
a shark as its major accessory, and that's what this come uh, this action figure is mostly known for. Now, I don't have one in my crazy ass collection. For some reason, that's the other problem with the Cobra Eel version two. It's often overlooked. I mean, you have a version one that's such an icon, and then it kind of like, eh, if it wasn't for that freaking shark, nobody would you know pay attention to this figure. As a matter of fact, they released it in 93 without the shark, and no one to little fanfare, sadly. But I think that's what makes this action figure really important because it is a clear uh, line in the sand of the Gen X and the millennial fan base. But at the same time, it is a figure that even Gen Xers can appreciate because of that freaking shark. Back to you, HCC788. Thanks. I'd like to say a few words about our friend Kevin from BX257. Kevin, if you ever see this, I hope you're well. I hope you return to us someday. We miss you. Uh, you started all this. You inspired all of this. You were doing G.I. Joe on YouTube before any of us jumped on and started following in your footsteps. So thank you. Thank you for being such a good friend and collaborator. I sincerely hope you're doing well and I hope to hear from you again someday. Now a few of my friends would like to talk about Kevin. Hey hey! Well what can I say about Kevin? He's always made some great content and he was one of the original Cobra Convergents. We had a blast working with him every single time, so I'm very grateful we got the opportunity to do stuff together. And when I first started making videos, he was one of the first persons on the YoJo forums to say something nice, saying that he wished he could be as funny as me, which was a huge surprise and a huge compliment to me. And I've always been grateful for that. Brian, I want you to know that it's hot as hell here right now, so I'm not wearing any pants, and I want that you to be aware of that. Same. Steve from G.I. Joeberg just saying Kevin from BX257 was the YouTube reviewer who ran so that the rest of us could crawl. And we are eternally grateful for him paving the way. Thank you, Kevin, wherever you are out there. We are ready for your triumphant return, if ever you choose to make it. Yojo and Cobra! I'm Kevin from Peg Warmers, and I just wanted to say a few things about Formby X257. He was a trailblazer. He was one of the first people to do G.I. Joe reviews and even really toy reviews on YouTube. It just it just wasn't the common thing that it is now for uh, adult men to be looking back at their childhood with uh, rose-colored glasses and kind of analyzing the things they grew up with. He did a great job. I always loved his backdrop with all the different card backs. Um, he had a very straightforward and succinct delivery that was awesome. And I wish Kevin well. I hope whatever he's doing it brings him happiness, and I'd love to see another video pop up on his channel someday. Thanks, HC788. Now, I'm not going to speak from a script or anything. I'm talking straight from the heart because that's how much Form BX257 means to me and where I am as far as my fandom. Kevin was an absolute mentor. He was he would be so gracious in giving his time, his knowledge. It wasn't about me or how many views I get. Or The bottom line is G.I. Joe is about a group of people working together of various backgrounds and skill sets to um, achieve a common goal. That is it. You know, I made so many friends um, just being a part of this community. And the few of us content creators that you see here, the, the OG guys, we're such a small, tight knit group. And that's something you cannot put a price down. So this is actually bittersweet because as of right now, you know, we've never heard, I like to think he's retired somewhere, but the fact of the matter is, you know, we came out of the COVID and stuff, we don't know. And I just want Kevin to know that he's had such an impact on me. Um, he showed me kindness, compassion, and he's just a wonderful guy. And I think all of you, if you watch this and you're on Facebook and you started a group, 
take a time to acknowledge Kevin's contribution because there wouldn't be a GI Joe today if Kevin wasn't the one holding the spark. Because when nobody gave, GI Joe was dead in the waters and Kevin started doing his content. We don't know how much time we have on this earth. It could be gone tomorrow. So make it a point to uh, let the people know how much you care about them, how much they mean to you, and look outward, not inward. You know, praise somebody else. Tell somebody else that, you know, they're worth a lot. They mean a lot because you have no idea what that person is going through and how much that uh, response and feedback is uh, uplifting. Nine out of 10, you've watched his videos. And yes, he is an Asian Canadian, but the most important thing, he's a Joe fan. And he's a damn knowledgeable and excellent Joe fan. He's one of the top five Joe fans uh, of all Joe fandom. <laughs> but Kevin, I just want you to know that you know wherever you are, thank you, thank you for being nice to me. You know, um, I know. I I just want you to know that you know we miss you, and wherever you are, we just hope that you're happy, and um, you know you're doing well. Kevin, form BX257. What can I say? We miss seeing you around. Uh, we just hope that all is well with you. We hope that you're happy and healthy and just taking a break from uh, the G.I. Joe world. And uh, we just hope to see you back soon. Uh, if not, we just again, we just hope all is well and uh, just take care. Thank you. Hey there, Zarana here. I just wanted to say when we're not drinking grape soda or listening to Cold Slither, us Dreadnoughts like to watch Kevin's videos. Greetings, JoeFan84 here. Just going to talk a little bit about ForumBX257. Uh, I had stumbled upon his channel a few years ago when I uh, restarted collecting G.I. Joe again. Um, I'm more of a modern collector, and they don't make uh, many modern vehicles, so uh, I started watching him, and he does really excellent reviews on the vehicles, and he has a segment on his channel, and he shows if a modern figure can fit in the vehicle or not. And um, that's really helpful. Uh, we haven't heard from him for a few year, a couple of years now. And uh, hopefully him and his family are happy, healthy, and safe. Take care. That was our review of the 1992 Cobra Eels version two. I hope you enjoyed it. Kevin, if you ever see this, please reach out. We would love to hear from you. We have a lot more Cobra Convergence going on this month. The presenters coming up this week include Action Robot Punch, Audible Interlude, The Order of Battle Podcast, Yorktown Joe, The Joe on Joe Podcast, My Side of the Laundry Room, Rob Vegas, the Photo Viper, G.I. Joburg, and Ratface44 Reviews. Make sure you check out the full calendar at hcc788.com and find out how you can participate and join the Convergence. Please give this video a thumbs up on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter. If you'd like to help out the channel, Patreon is a great way to do it. You can get some special perks and you can get your name in videos like the names you see scrolling on the screen right now. I'll see you next time for more Cobra Convergence. Until then, remember, only Cobra is Cobra. That's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.